Chapter six of Glengarry School Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Glengarry School Days by Ralph Connor. Chapter six. One that ruleth well his own house. The news of the school trouble ran through the section like fire through a brule. The younger generations, when they heard how Thomas Finch had dared the master, raised him at once to the rank of hero. But the heads of families received the news doubtfully, and wondered what the rising generation was coming to. The next day Billy Jack heard the story in the twentieth store, and with some anxiety waited for the news to reach his father's ears, for, to tell the truth, Billy Jack, man though he was, held his father in dread. "'How did you come to do it?' he asked Thomas. "'Why didn't you let Don begin? It was surely Don's business.' I don't know. It slipped out," replied Thomas. I couldn't stand Jimmy's yelling any longer. I didn't know I said anything till I found myself standing up, and after that I didn't seem to care for anything. Man, it was fine, though," said Billy Jack. I didn't think it was in you. And Thomas felt more than repaid for all his cruel beating. It was something to win the approval of Billy Jack in an affair of this kind. It was at church on the Sabbath day that Donald Finch heard about his son's doings in the school the week before. The minister, in his sermon, thought fit to dwell upon the tendency of the rising generation to revolt against authority in all things, and solemnly laid upon parents the duty and responsibility of seeing to it that they ruled their households well. It was not just the advice that Donald Finch stood specially in need of, but he was highly pleased with the sermon, and was enlarging upon it in the churchyard where the people gathered between the services, when Peter McRae, thinking that old Donald was hardly taking the minister's advice to himself as he ought, and not knowing that the old man was ignorant of all that had happened in the school, answered him somewhat severely. It is good to be approving the sermon, but I would rather be seeing you make a practical application of it. Indeed, that is true, replied Donald, and it would not be amiss for more than me to make application of it. Indeed, then, if all reports be true, replied Peter, it would be well for you to begin at home. Mr. McRae, said Donald earnestly, it is myself that knows well enough my shortcomings, but if there is any special reason for your remark, I am not aware of it. This light treatment of what to Peter had seemed a grievous offence against all authority incensed the old dominie beyond all endurance. And do you not think that the conduct of your son last week calls for any reproof? And is it you that will stand up and defend it in the face of the minister and his sermon upon it this day? Donald gazed at him a few moments as if he had gone mad. At length he replied slowly, I do not wish to forget that you are an elder of the church, Mr. McRae, and I will not be charging you with telling lies on me and my family. Tut, tut, man, broke in Long John Cameron, seeing how the matter stood. He's just referring to yon little difference Thomas had with the master last week, but it's just nothing. Come away in. Thomas? gasped Donald. My Thomas? You have not heard, then, said Peter, in surprise, and old Donald only shook his head. "'Then it's time you did,' replied Peter severely, "'for such things are a disgrace to the community.' "'Nonsense,' said Long John, "'not a bit of it. I think none the less of Thomas for it.' But in matters of this kind Long John could hardly be counted an authority, for it was not so very long ago since he had been beguiled into an affair at the Scotch River which, while it brought him laurels at the hands of the younger generation, did not add to his reputation with the elders of the church.' It did not help matters much that Murdy Cameron and others of his set proceeded to congratulate old Donald in their own way upon his son's achievement, and with all the more fervor that they perceived that it moved the solemn Peter to righteous wrath. From one and another the tale came forth, with embellishments, till Donald Finch was reduced to such a state of voiceless rage and humiliation that when, at the sound of the opening psalm, the congregation moved into the church for the Gaelic service, the old man departed for his home, trembling, silent, amazed. How Thomas could have brought this disgrace upon him, he could not imagine. 
if it had been william john who with all his good nature had a temper brittle enough he would not have been surprised and then the minister sermon of which he had spoken in such open and enthusiastic approval how it condemned him for his neglect of duty toward his family and held up his authority over his household to scorn it was a terrible blow to his pride it is the lord's judgment upon me he said to himself as he tramped his way through the woods it is the curse of eli that is hanging over me and mine and with many vows he resolved that at all costs he would do his duty in this crisis and bring thomas to a sense of his sins it was in this spirit that he met his family at the supper-table after their return from the gaelic service what is this i hear about you thomas he began as thomas came in and took his place at the table what is this i hear about you sir he repeated making a great effort to maintain a calm and judicial tone thomas remained silent partly because he usually found speech difficult but chiefly because he dreaded his father's wrath what is this that has become the talk of the countryside and the disgrace of my name continued the father in deepening tones no very great disgrace surely said billy jack lightly hoping to turn his father's anger be you silent sir commanded the old man sternly i will ask for your opinion when i require it you and others beside you in this house need to learn your places billy jack made no reply fearing to make matters worse though he found it hard not to resent this taunt which he knew well was flung at his mother i wonder at you thomas after such a sermon as yon i wonder you are able to sit there unconcerned at this table i wonder you are not hiding your head in shame and confusion the old man was lashing himself into a white rage while thomas sat looking stolidly before him his slow tongue finding no words of defence and indeed he had little thought of defending himself he was conscious of an acute self-condemnation and yet struggling through his slow-moving mind there was a feeling that in some sense he could not define there was justification for what he had done it is not often that thomas has grieved you ventured the mother timidly for with all her courage she feared her husband when he was in this mood woman be silent blazed forth the old man as if he had been waiting for her words it is not for you to excuse his wickedness you were too fond of that work and your children are reaping the fruits of it billy jack looked up quickly as if to answer but his mother turned her face full upon him and commanded him with steady eyes giving herself no sign of emotion except for a slight tightening of the lips and a touch of color in her face your children have well learned their lesson of rebellion and deceit continued her husband allowing his passion a free rein but i vow unto the lord i will put an end to it now whatever and i will give you to remember sir turning to thomas to the end of your days this occasion and now hence from this table let me not see your face till the sabbath is past and then if the lord spares me i shall deal with you thomas hesitated a moment as if he had not quite taken in his father's words then leaving his supper untouched he rose slowly and without a word climbed the ladder to the loft the mother followed him a moment with her eyes and then once more turning to billy jack held him with calm steady gaze her immediate fear was for her eldest son thomas she knew would in the meantime simply suffer what might be his lot but for many a day she had lived in terror of an outbreak between her eldest son and her husband again billy jack caught her look and commanded himself to silence the fire is low william john she said in a quiet voice billy jack rose and from the wood-box behind the stove replenished the fire reading perfectly his mother's mind and resolving at all costs to do her will at the taking of the books that night the prayer which was spoken in a tone of awful and almost inaudible solemnity was for the most part an exaltation of the majesty and righteousness of the government of god and a lamentation over the wickedness and rebellion of mankind 
and billy jack thought it was no good augury that it closed with a petition for grace to maintain the honor of that government and to uphold that righteous majesty in all the relations of life it was a woeful evening to them all and as soon as possible the household went miserably to bed before going to her room the mother slipped up quietly to the loft and found thomas lying in his bunk dressed and awake he was still puzzling out his ethical problem his conscience clearly condemned him for his fight with the master and yet somehow he could not regret having stood up for jimmy and taken his punishment he expected no mercy at his father's hands next morning the punishment he knew would be cruel enough but it was not the pain that thomas was dreading he was dimly struggling with the sense of outrage for ever since the moment he had stood up and uttered his challenge to the master he had felt himself to be different that moment now seemed to belong to the distant years when he was a boy and now he could not imagine himself submitting to a flogging from any man and it seemed to him strange and almost impossible that even his father should lift his hand to him you are not sleeping thomas said his mother going up to his bunk no mother and you have had no supper at all i don't want any mother the mother sat silent beside him for a time and then said quietly you did not tell me thomas no mother i didn't like it would have been better that your father should have heard this from i mean should have heard it at home and you might have told me thomas yes mother i wish now i had but indeed i can't understand how it happened i don't feel as if it was me at all and then thomas told his mother all the tale finishing his story with the words that i couldn't help it mother at all the mother remained silent for a little and then with a little tremor in her voice she replied no thomas i know you couldn't help it and i hear her voice quite broke i'm not ashamed of you are you not mother said thomas sitting up suddenly in great surprise then i don't care i couldn't make it out well never you mind thomas it will be well and she leaned over him and kissed him thomas felt her face wet with tears and his stolid reserve broke down oh mother mother i don't care now he cried his breath coming in great sobs i don't care at all and he put his arms round his mother clinging to her as if he had been a child i know laddie i know whispered his mother never you fear never fear and then as if to herself she added thank the lord you are not a coward whatever thomas found himself again without words but he held his mother fast his big body shaking with his sobs and thomas she continued after a pause your father we must just be patient all her life long this had been her struggle and and he is a good man her tears were now flowing fast and her voice had quite lost its calm thomas was alarmed and distressed he had never in all his life seen his mother weep and rarely had heard her voice break don't mother he said growing suddenly quiet himself don't you mind mother it'll be all right and i'm not afraid yes she said rising and regaining her self-control it will be all right thomas you go to sleep and there were such evident reserves of strength behind her voice that thomas lay down certain that all would be well his mother had never failed him the mother went downstairs with the purpose in her heart of having a talk with her husband but donald finch knew her ways well and had resolved that he would have no speech with her upon the matter for he knew that it would be impossible for him to persevere in his intention to deal with thomas if he allowed his wife to have any talk with him the morning brought the mother no opportunity of speech with her husband he contrary to his custom remained until breakfast in his room outside in the kitchen he could hear billy jack's cheerful tones and hearty laugh and it angered him to think that his displeasure should have so little effect upon his household 
if the house had remained shrouded in gloom and the family had gone about on tiptoes and with bated breath it would have shown no more than a proper appreciation of the father's displeasure but as billy jack's cheerful words and laughter fell upon his ear he renewed his vows to do his duty that day in upholding his authority and bringing to his son a due sense of his sin in grim silence he ate his breakfast except for a sharp rebuke to billy jack who had been laboring throughout the meal to make cheerful conversation with jessac and his mother at his father's rebuke billy jack dropped his cheerful tone and avoiding his mother's eyes he assumed at once an attitude of open defiance his tones and words plainly offering to his father war if war he would have you will come to me in the room after breakfast said his father as thomas rose to go to the stable there's a meeting of the trustees at nine o'clock at the schoolhouse at which thomas must be present interposed billy jack in firm steady tones he may go when i have done with him said his father angrily and meantime you will attend to your own business yes sir i will that billy jack's response came back with fierce promptness the old man glanced at him caught the light in his eyes hesitated a moment and then throwing all restraint to the winds thundered out what do you mean sir what i say i am going to attend to my own business and that soon billy jack's tone was quick eager defiant again the old man hesitated and then replied go to it then i am going and i am going to take thomas to that meeting at nine o'clock i did not know that you had business there said the old man sarcastically then you may know it now blazed forth billy jack for i am going and as sure as i stand here i will see that thomas gets fair play there if he doesn't at home if i have to lick every trustee in the section hold your peace sir said his father coming nearer him do not give me any impertinence and do not accuse me of unfairness have you heard thomas's side of the story returned billy jack i have heard enough and more than enough you haven't heard both sides i know the truth of it whatever the shameful and disgraceful truth of it i know that the countryside is ringing with it i know that in the house of god the minister held up my family to the scorn of the people and i vowed to do my duty to my house the old man's passion had risen to such a height that for a moment billy jack quailed before it in the pause that followed the old man's outburst the mother came to her son hush william john you are not to forget yourself nor your duty to your father and to me thomas will receive full justice in this matter there was a quiet strength and dignity in her manner that commanded immediate attention from both men the mother went on in a low even voice your father has his duty to perform and you must not take it upon yourself to interfere billy jack could hardly believe his ears that his mother should desert him and should support what he knew she felt to be injustice and tyranny was more than he could understand no less perplexed was her husband as they stood there looking at each other uncertain as to the next step there came a knock at the back door the mother went to open it pausing on her way to push back some chairs and put the room to rights thus allowing the family to regain its composure good morning mrs finch you will be thinking i have slept in your barn all night it was long john cameron come away in mr cameron it is never too early for friends to come to this house said mrs finch her voice showing her great relief long john came in glanced shrewdly about and greeted mr finch with great heartiness it's a fine winter day mr finch but it looks as if we might have a storm you were busy with the logs i hear old donald was slowly recovering himself and a fine lot you are having continued long john i was just saying the other day that it was wonderful the work you could get through indeed it is hard enough to do anything here said donald finch with some bitterness you may say so responded long john cheerfully the snow is that deep in the bush and you were wanting to see me mr cameron interrupted donald i have business on hand which requires attention indeed and so have i for it is and indeed it is just as well you and all should know it for my disgrace is well known disgrace exclaimed long john ay disgrace for is it not a disgrace to have the conduct of your family become the occasion of a sermon on the lord's day 
indeed i did not think much of yon sermon whatever replied long john i cannot agree with you mr cameron it was a powerful sermon and it was only too sorely needed but i hope it will not be without profit to myself indeed it is not the sermon you have much need of said long john for every one knows what ay it is myself that needs it but with the help of the lord i will be doing my duty this morning and i am very glad to hear that replied long john for that is why i am come and what may you have to do with it asked the old man as to that indeed replied long john coolly i am not yet quite sure but if i might ask without being too bold what is the particular duty to which you are referring you may ask and you and all have a right to know for i am about to visit upon my son his sins and shame and is it meaning to weep him you are ay said the old man and his lips came fiercely together indeed then you will just do no such thing this morning and by what right do you interfere in my domestic affairs demanded old donald with dignity answer me that mr cameron right or no right replied long john before any man lays a finger on thomas there he will need to begin with myself and he added grimly there are not many in the county who would care for that job old donald finch looked at his visitor in speechless amazement at length long john grew excited man alive he exclaimed it's a queer father you are you may be thinking it disgrace but the section will be proud that there is a boy in it brave enough to stand up for the weak against a brute bully and then he proceeded to tell the tale as he had heard it from don with such strong passion and such rude vigor that in spite of himself old donald found his rage vanish and his heart began to move within him toward his son and it is for that cried long john dashing his fist into his open palm it is for that that you would punish your son may god forgive me but the man that lays a finger on thomas yonder will come into sore grief this day ay lad continued long john striding toward thomas and gripping him by the shoulders with both hands you are a man and you stood up for the weak yon day and if you ever will be wanting a friend remember john cameron well well mr cameron said old donald who was more deeply moved than he cared to show it may be as you say it may be the lad was not so much in the wrong in the wrong roared long john blowing his nose hard in the wrong may my boys ever be in the wrong in such a way well said old donald we shall see about this and if thomas has suffered injustice it is not his father will refuse to see him righted and soon they were all off to the meeting at the schoolhouse. Thomas was the last to leave the room. As usual, he had not been able to find a word, but stood white and trembling. But as he found himself alone with his mother, once more his stolid reserve broke down, and he burst into a strange and broken cry. Oh, mother, mother! But he could get no further. Never mind, laddie, said his mother. You have borne yourself well, and your mother is proud of you. At the investigation held in the schoolhouse, it became clear that, though the insubordination of both Jimmy and Thomas was undeniable, the provocation by the master had been very great. And though the minister, who was superintendent of instruction for the district, insisted that the master's authority must at all costs be upheld, such was the rage of old donald finch and long john cameron that the upshot was that the master took his departure from the section glad enough to escape with bones unbroken End of chapter six